roughly 20% of the ETU membership went to war. Australia was saying, your country needs you. If Britain falls, Australia falls, so you need, we need you fellas to go out there and to fight for your country. And they did, and they went out there uh, to face unknown, unimaginable hurdles in this fight. At the start of the war, um, membership was about 812. It fluctuated between uh, 800 and 1,000 during the war years as people went off to war, as people came back, as the trade was growing, it was growing so fast, people were joining and, um, because just because you went to war didn't mean that you suspended your membership, you were still a member of the Union. The only time you lost your membership was if you died. There were 25 of our ETU members that were soldiers that lost their lives in the war. Um, and they're still, they're still lost, and they're still buried half a world away. Finding our ETU members who went to war and telling their stories is one way of uh, honouring their memories, showing them the respect that they truly deserve and keeping their memory as sacred. We tend to measure our heroes by the medals that have been awarded to them, but when you look through the records of our soldiers, you can see that you can't do that. They were all out there and they were all heroes in their own way, just trying to do their bit for Australia and for their families back home. I became aware of the work of Lambus and Glasos and Tim Whitford in finding all of those lost soldiers buried in unmarked pits by the Germans after the Battle of Fromel in 1916. The work these guys did to give those soldiers, those diggers, back their identity, back their dignity, I think is a compelling story. And it struck me that our union has no record of our servicemen and women who fought for our country. We have nothing to honour them or respect them. You see in old schools and in some workplaces, honour boards recognising their students or their citizens or their employees. We should recognise the ETU boys who fought and died. And these diggers, these ETU men, are a part of our history too. And it's a part of our history that hasn't been told. I think it's critically important that we understand ETU members who went off to war, why they went, their lives, those who died, those who came back, and how their lives were shaped and how their lives then shaped the society we live in. Uh, Lambus and I, um, we've, we've sort of been campaigners for the, for the missing of the First World War for some time now and, uh, you know, we've been called many things, you know, we've been called historians and, and uh, crusaders, etc. In actual fact, we're just a couple of schmucks. He's a uh, former teacher and a, and a hippie from um, the inner suburbs of Melbourne and I'm a former soldier uh, from, <laughs> from Yarram in South Gippsland. Our bag, uh, up until recently, has been uh, the Battle of Fromel and finding the missing of the, of the Battle of Fromel. Fromel was the first major battle that the Australians faced on the Western Front. And um, it, was a, it was carnage, it was just butchery, brutal butchery. We'd been at Fromel for five days, the Germans had been there for a year and a half almost, and the idea was to try and hold troops in place there. The German troops were going to go down to the Somme, and General Haking was in charge of that particular battle. This is Haking here. He's, a, he's a, uh, a British officer who has come in charge of uh, the 5th Australian Division uh, in, in July 1916. Uh, this is the first time uh, the Australians are going to com be committed to a major battle on the Western Front in France. Uh, they've, uh, they've just arrived. They've been in France for three weeks and they fall into the hands of this man. The Battle of Fromel was the very first battle for Australians on the Western Front. The men were well trained, well equipped, well motivated and ready for the fight. So on the 19th of July 1916, the Australians go in and they make their very first attack on the Western Front. In the words of one Australian commander at the battle, it was uh, a tactical abortion. Uh, this man didn't put enough planning into it and it was a disaster. And in fact, the uh, Battle of Fromel remains the single bloodiest day in Australian history. It has never been topped. This is a remarkable photograph actually taken on the night of the battle, the 19th of July 1916, and uh, it features the German line and the Australian line. 
This is a two division attack. A division's about 12,000 blokes. So we've got the 61st British Division. They attacked with, uh, with vigour and they took a lot of casualties. However, the lion's share of the casualties at the Battle of Fromel, this disaster of Fromel, were taken by the Australian uh, 5th Division. Zero hour for the battle was at six o'clock in the evening on the 19th of July and uh, the soldiers of the 5th Australian Division started across no man's land. The uh, one part of that division uh, was the 15th Brigade, almost entirely from Victoria and uh, they had 400 metres of uh, bare open ground to cover. Uh, they were uh, absolutely slaughtered by machine guns and unfortunately uh, almost all the bodies of those men were doomed to lie out in no man's land until the end of the war. Uh, a few minutes after the 15th Brigade hop off, the 14th Brigade hop off. And it's predictable what's going to happen to them as well. Their no man's land on the right hand side is about 350 metres wide. On the left hand side, it's about 120 metres wide. So half that brigade is effectively decimated. Small groups uh, are able to get across, but they're disjointed. They can't form a line. The 8th Brigade, off they go, and they charge across no man's land. And the 8th Brigade gets across uh, pretty well intact. But then they go out of the frying pan and into the fire. They've been told, these Australians, once you get through, don't just take those German trenches. We want you to keep going. This is General Haking. Keep going, men. We want you to find and hold the second line of German trenches. Now, I've looked at this photo 500 million times in the last few years, and I can't see a second line of German trenches in this photo. And the reason I couldn't find that uh, second line of German trenches is because there isn't bloody one there. So, some of these men in these little scattered groups go forward looking for this second line of German trenches. And then the Germans really kick in their counter-attack plan. The Germans have been here for 18 months. Our guys had been there for three days. And in that 18 months, the Germans had rehearsed for this moment. This was going to be their finest hour. And so when the sun comes down in the dark, down they come off the ridge. How could the Germans tell each other apart? Well, the Germans were all singing their national anthem. Anyone not singing the German national anthem that night was killed. And so by about four in the morning on the 20th of July, there are no Australians left fighting in the, uh, in the German line at Fromel. It's found that uh, during that battle, we have lost 5,533 men killed, wounded, taken prisoner, or simply missing, from, gone, disappeared from the face of the earth. The single bloodiest day in Australian history is recorded in the newspaper in London as some significant raids took place near uh, Armentiers where uh, significant numbers of German prisoners were taken. That's it. That's how the Times reports it. The single bloodiest day in Australian history. Our own General, General Mackay, in the days after the battle, he says, uh, they'll get used to it. And Sir uh, Richard Haking says, uh, it's probably done the Australians a great deal of good. No Man's Land was full of our dead and, and wounded. And the compounding tragedy of the Battle of Fromel was the fact that um, the Germans offered us a truce so the dead and wounded could be gathered after the battle, but we knocked it back. Our own general, General Mackay, could have shown some compassion for his men and allowed that truce. But what that meant was that the majority of the wounded were left out there for more and the dead were left out there for more than two and a half years before their bodies could be recovered. There were many selfless acts of courage in the days after the battle. As many as 30 Australians are killed going out to bring in their wounded mates because they can't stand down. They can hear them and they can see them, so they go out there to try and bring them back. And this is what meets the Germans the next morning. There are now significant numbers of Australian dead in and around their trenches, uh, as, as well as their own dead from that night. Uh, because it's high summer in northern France, there is a problem uh, on their hands. They need to get these men gathered and uh, processed for intelligence purposes and put underground very quickly uh, before the spread of disease takes over. And the Germans, they took many, many photographs and it's the interpretation of photographs that led us on this process of research and uh, advocacy because we have many photographs showing Australian and British soldiers being taken back somewhere for burial. This one shows the main street of Fromel, uh, a bit blown up at about the time of the battle. But what's significant about this photo, 
uh, it shows this railway running down the left hand side of the street. And what, uh, what we've found out is that the Germans had this network of light railway running behind the German uh, front line. And they can, using these little push trolleys on railway tracks, get men and equipment anywhere in their front line very quickly. Again, here we have that light rail, and on that light rail we have the carts uh, stacked high with the bodies of Australian and British soldiers being taken somewhere behind the ground, the German lines for burial, somewhere. We looked at aerial photographs and looking for anomalies in the ground. The 17th of June 1916, there's that light rail cutting through the corner of the wood, and before the wood, no digging at all. Then, 10 days after the battle, and you can see that eight big pits have, have magically appeared, and there's lots of foot traffic and earth being moved around those pits. If you go to Christmas time of the same year, you can see that five of those eight pits are now backfilled and mounded up. And then by the end of the war, three of those eight pits have been left open. The five that had been backfilled and mounded up have now, because of the fertile soil of France, the grass has grown and these things have just disappeared into the background of France. You know, we, we thought we had it. So a case was made to the Australian Army at this time. Uh, up, our crew went to Canberra, presented our case, and they said, not enough evidence. Come back and get some more evidence. Which is what we did. Which is what we did. Eventually, a German document was found in Munich, dated two days after the battle, which just said, you will prepare ground before pheasant wood for 400. That was uh, a very important document, because it had mentioned these five collective graves. And it, uh, it solved the first piece of that puzzle, that there was once a mass grave. Whether it was still there was yet to be, uh, yet to be uh, proven. Here we have a modern day photograph. Even here I believe you can detect some undulation in the ground. The landowner told us that they tried to plough that land but it was too lumpy to plough. They tried to plant vegetables but the vegetables never ever grew there. All that ever grew there were these strange little blue flowers. We always had this uh, Plan 27B which was go there in the dark with a shovel, a torch, and a good French lawyer. But we didn't need it in the end because this guy Tony Pollard and his team from Glasgow University uh, came up trumps. What they did was they, uh, they brought this clever technology as he talks about, that a ground penetrating radar, which looks through the ground. And what that proved was there'd once been some holes there. Then they went over it, and this is where it got good. They went over it with some of the best metal detectors in the world. And what they came up with was 772 metallic artefacts. On the second last day of the dig, they found this thing. And this was the key to the puzzle which led us to finding 250 uh, lost men. So this artefact, this one thing, about the size of a 10 cent piece, proved that Australian soldiers had been there. Now we knew from the historical record that they'd never been there alive. How did this thing get here? It went, it came there on a dead man. And to make matters even uh, more exciting for us, we were able to track this one particular artefact down to one individual, one man, and it was this fella. His name's Private Harry Willis. He's a 19-year-old kid when he joins the army. He's from Alberton in South Gippsland, and he's given that medallion from his shire, the Shire of Alberton, has a good luck charm before he leaves. Uh, Harry Willis is my great uncle, and I had been searching for him almost my entire life. And then out of the ground pops up his good luck medallion. Now, I was a soldier for a long time, and the last thing I ever want to experience is to be left in someone's paddock for eternity with nothing marking me and never get my name. This is what we are so passionate about. We had seen them, and we think it is not good enough to leave good Australian boys lying in paddocks. These men did not want to die. They wanted to go home to their families, get the job done, go home, raise kids, and, uh, and live their lives. These men did not want to die. Anyone who tells you that soldiers lay down their life for your country, I'll call them a liar. None of my mates ever signed up for that. They have their lives ripped from them violently in the night. And there, this was the same with these poor men. Through the process, we were told that this is ancient history, let it go, you know, uh, people really don't care about what way back then. A lot of people are saying, why don't you leave them there in peace with their mates? You know, they're buried with their mates, they fought together, they're buried together, leave them alone. And that's wonderful sentiment. But you know what, we'd seen them. 
and I saw a boy in there with telephone wire still wrapped around his ankle where they dragged him across a paddock and just dragged him into a pit. I had seen one boy there lying on his back with his arms outstretched looking like Jesus on the cross and his mouth wide open like he was screaming. There was another boy there uh, lying in the fetal position and yet two more boys there, 15 years of age, but we don't know who they are. So if you just put a memorial on top of these holes, you remove any chance of these guys getting one, their dignity back, and two, their identity back. People need uh, to know what happened. They take ownership of their own family history and their country's history. And what they seek to do through acts of remembrance is to find their, their missing soldiers. And it is not blood specific. I believe there's a collective ownership of the process and the ground at Pheasant Wood and the ongoing research. If you can find them, got to do it. Thousands of Australians had come forward offering their DNA. You know, did you have a soldier, they asked, did you have a soldier in your family that was killed at the Battle of Fromel? Thousands of people came forward. And it was a wonderful thing. 16th of March at 10 to 9 in the morning, I got a phone call and it was uh, uh, the army and they said it's my honour and my duty to inform you that among the remains at Pheasant Wood uh, positively identified the remains of your great uncle Harry Willis and he will now have a, a grave of his own with his name on it. So name returned, dignity returned. First thing I had to do was jump in the car and I broke 27 land speed records getting to South Gippsland because I wanted to be the one that told my nan my beautiful nana that, that started all this with me. See, she'd grown up in a house of broken men and broken women. She could never speak Harry's name. His photo was on the mantelpiece. They had to whisper his name for fear of upsetting his mum. You know, and this happened in families all over the world. No more of that. Have a look at the look on her face. No teeth, of course. Um, she'd, uh, she'd offered to give DNA and I said, look, nan, you know, yep, she said, I'll do it, no drama. I said, Nan, you might have to, they might have to chop off your finger to do it. And uh, she said, oh, well, if I have to. <laughs> Grief is contagious. It, it is passed down through the generations. And there's something about closing that loop for them, that, that, giving them the ability to say goodbye, whether it's that generation or the ones that follow. It's a place, you then give that person the place uh, of pilgrimage, a place to go and weep for their, for their forebears, and I think that is really important. The simple fact that thousands upon thousands of Australians travelled to Fromel for the final burial at Fromel illustrates just how connected Australian people are to uh, the dead of the past. And, and it, there was a collective uh, sigh of relief, I think, that those men at Fromel had been found uh, by people that were not necessarily related to them but just felt a connection because of uh, the, the bonds of nationhood. So over three weeks, uh, 249 are buried. Each of them has a full uh, military burial with a, a priest reading over them. You know, the bonds of nationhood are uh, one strand that, can, that draw us to these men. Uh, there are many others. It's not just about honouring the missing and the dead. We want to honour all ETU soldiers that served in that war and remember their lives and their contributions. We had ETU members in all the major battles just throughout the First World War. Alf Galbraith, he was a signaller. He was a 20-year-old signaller, um, electrician. Uh, and he was out there on the battlefield on the 15th of July. This is before the battle, major battle started. So I'm only presuming that he was laying the telephones in preparation for the battle. And while he was doing that, he was shot and wounded. And he died before the major battle on the 19th of July, 1916. And that was, that was his, his war over. Then we had another young bloke called Cliffy Angus, a 19 year old soldier who had to have a letter from his mum to say, yeah, he, I let my son join the army. So Clifford had this letter from his mum giving him permission to join the army and he'd gone off to fight for his country and his first battle was in uh, Bramel. And he marched into battle on the 19th with all the other soldiers and uh, he was wounded, shot and wounded. Now Cliff was typical of um, all of the soldiers that went to war, uh, determined to see it through to the end. He, he was wounded at Bramel's 
but he was con subsequently wounded twice more before the war ended. Each time he would come back and, and get uh, fixed up, rehabilitated and go back out there, back onto the front, back into the hell that he used experienced before to see it through to the end. And that takes a lot of courage. So, after Framel was over, um, you know, everyone was slapping each other on the back. We had decided that our work uh, is far from finished. So we looked at uh, the next battle that, uh, that was logical, this Battle of Bulacore. This, uh, this battlefield at Bulacore, you know, it's beautiful rolling farmland now, um, uh, but in 1917, April and May 1917, it was a place of abject horror. Well, Bulacore was another one of those um, inexplicable diversionary battles that in the end, turned out to be an enormous cost in life for absolutely no military gain whatsoever. The first Battle of Bullicourt took place on the 10th and the 11th of uh, April 1917. General Haig decided he would send his troops into the Bullicourt area, which was like a little amphitheatre, and the Germans, they were a professional outfit, and they had their machine gun nests situated absolutely perfectly around the perimeter of this amphitheatre. Even so, uh, Haig and his generals decided they would send in the soldiers. And uh, they didn't have any artillery, it was off elsewhere, and one of the other battles that the French were doing, so they decided to give them 12 training tanks. These are fancy brand new uh, state-of-the-art warfare uh, machines. And so they sent them these tanks, but these tanks couldn't, couldn't even go as fast as the soldiers could walk. So the soldiers got fed up with them, and they didn't, and, they, and they, they marched ahead of them. They made so much noise that these tanks alerted the Germans to the actual um, allies coming forward, going forward. And so when they saw these tanks, they spread them with their machine gun fire and thought, oh, the bullets go straight through, this is easy. They were no better than cardboard cutouts, these, these tanks, there's 12 of them, they didn't even get to the front line. They didn't even get to the trenches, the Germans just sprayed them with uh, bullet uh, with machine gun fire and, and stopped them in their tracks and so the, the Aussies went without them. Uh, Australians smashed into this line and through sheer guts and bravery held this line for a short time and uh, we're talking about belts of barbed wire 50 metres thick with machine guns and artillery covering it. These, uh, this battle is horror and there are so many, so, so many fine young Australian men uh, lying under this soil being ploughed year after year after year. We had one of our members who was, was part of that, and his name was Eddie Busbridge. Eddie Busbridge was an Essendon boy who enlisted in July 1915, aged 23. He landed in Marseille in France in June 1916, and his first taste of war was at Pozier on the Somme, where he was wounded. When he recovered, he was sent into battle at Bullicar on the 11th of April, and uh, when the battle was over on the 12th, it only took, a, it only took just over 24 hours and the smoke had uh, dissipated. Eddie was uh, listed as missing in action. He'd been wounded and captured by the Germans. Eddie spent the rest of the war in a German POW camp and was repatriated to Britain on December 1918. Because that was a, so, such a major failure, they pulled the troops out and then the general said, oh, well, we'll just have another go. And so they grabbed as many troops as they could. They got another um, division of troops and said, we're going to go again. And they sent them in a second time. And a second time, it was just as brutal. There was just as much carnage. The locals, they built this monument. It's called the cross in the field between Bull Corps and Rion Corps, where many Australian soldiers assaulted over a two-month period. There are 2,243 missing from both battles of Bull Corps. Uh, last year it was uh, uh, kind of by accident, kind of a privilege that we ran into a, uh, a crew from Troubadours. the Electrical Trades Union uh, who just happened to be loitering with intent in that area and, and uh, uh, we, we were able to walk that ground and we were able to um, uh, find some amazing things. Uh, at this uh, at this battlefield, we we went to uh, a belt of barbed wire where the Australians or, or the place where uh, Australians had pierced a belt of barbed wire, and looking down on the ground, things were, things are always as they should be on a battlefield, 
We looked down and uh, walking through this cornfield, we were able to find pieces of Australian equipment and bits and pieces of uh, personal items left there uh, by Australians who died there in 1917. Bullet Corps was, uh, you know, it was a great victory for the German division that, uh, that fought there. Uh, there is nothing good about the Battle of Bullet Corps for Australia. What we're doing now is we're, we've sent a researcher with the help of the Electrical Trades Union, one of the best researchers in the world, a man called Peter Barton. He was instrumental in our Fromel work. Uh, he's gone to archives in Germany because we just can't find the evidence that we need to uh, locate these men. Uh, Peter Barton's in Germany looking for, uh, for any evidence of these burials uh, and we will now just wait and see. There were 25 of our ATU members that were soldiers that lost their lives. James Daniels is one of the first of the ATU members that I found. He is a 27-year-old 20, uh, electrician, and he joined up in August. Uh, as, at the same time, the war was declared, and, and he went off to Gallipoli, and he was killed on the 25th of April, 1915. We had a member called Frank uh, McCubrey. Now, he was a 19-year-old apprentice when he joined up. Came from Footscray, a Footscray boy, and uh, he was a signaller. On the um, 12th of May, he was uh, he was in one of the dugouts installing a company telephone, and when a shell hit it, and one of his soldier mates said he was just buried alive, and he's still wherever he is. He's never been found. The ETU was privileged to uh, to connect with uh, Frank McCubrey's family and to go at least somewhere to understanding just how a loss of a loved one affects a family for many years to come. And that was an experience that really brings it home to you as to why what we're doing is important. And they showed us a lot of his memorabilia and it was quite moving to look at this little notebook that he'd written in uh, during his training before he went there. Written in pencil, he's, he's, and he's talking about what he should remember. And you can read the excitement between the lines. But the poignancy of that was that you knew that in less than a year, he was going to be lost. These things, lots of families didn't talk about much about the war and what had happened. And of course, with no body found, that made it difficult. But the thing that we've got at home that Peter's mum had was a pocketbook, which as a kid, I can remember my grandmother who was Frank's mother, of course, saying to me, this was the pocketbook that Uncle Frank had. <laughs> and it's got holes through the pocketbook where shrapnel evidently had gone. And we still don't know whether he had it on him or whether it was elsewhere, but as far as the family were concerned, that was how he was killed. And Peter and his mum's got that uh, pocketbook at home and it's got papers in it which the holes go right through so it didn't the pocketbook didn't stop anything it just went straight through. Frank was one of those that was lost in unknown graves never be never to be found never to be known but there were six altogether. Um, there was Reggie Bryant and um, Henry Parker were lost in Gallipoli very early and then on the front on the western front we lost uh, Cliff Drummond, Frank McCubrey, Tiny Falloon and uh, Henry March. They were all, and they're all still somewhere beneath the soil in the fields of France. Tiny Falloon was a six foot two electrician from Richmond who was one of our most decorated members. He served in Gallipoli. Then he went over to France where he won the military medal and bar. And then on the evening of the 10th of April, outside of Plugstiet Wood in Belgium, put his head up over the parapet and was shot through the mouth by a machine gun, died instantly. We didn't really hear that he was a hero. We just heard what a wonderful person he was, what a wonderful brother he was. But it was not till much later, my son was, went to the shrine one day and asked to see Uncle Ned's records at the shrine. And he came back and he said, Mum, Uncle Ned was a hero. 
He's got a military medal and bar. Mm. Well, you see, there was no, no, mm. not much. Um, everyone said he was a wonderful soldier, the family, but nobody. I think after the First World War, they tended to wanted to forget the war. Mm. We didn't know he was a hero. I really think for soldiers in any war who go through combat and are really exposed to combat, if you read their war diaries, if you if you listen to what they say when they've been through so much hell, is they, they ask, how would anyone at home ever understand what we've done? And I think that led to a lot of the silence of the diggers. They couldn't explain to, to us what they'd been through, or even hope we could really grasp it. Perhaps now with better history and a, a more honest telling of the tale, we could relate to it better than the general public could back in 1917. We, we had no understanding of it, but um, I'm sure that my mother and, uh, and Leon's dad uh, and the other sister who was left at home at that time um, were deeply worried about what was going on in France and, uh, and certainly had their worries about Frank and his safety. But uh, of course, when you receive uh, a little canvas bag with these artefacts in it that are the only things that are left, of, uh, of a son that's gone overseas. Uh, we have no appreciation truly of just how deeply they felt uh, to have lost him. It's a really interesting point to ponder why so many thousands of young Australian men back in 1915, 16, 17, 18, left their world as they knew it, joined the army and, and fought in a bloody, horrible war, not of their making uh, halfway around the world in Europe. You know, it's interesting, I think, for some, undoubtedly, a spirit of adventure, uh, a bit of a fascination with Mother England, as it was known in those days. You know, there was a lot of hype about for king and country, and I think there's lots of reasons why those young men went to war. But I think then when you shift to those men when they were fighting together, when they're in the absolute hell of war, of trench warfare, and how horrible it was, they may have gone to war for different reasons, but they died for their mates, and they died with their mates, and it was the sense of mateship. I think king and country meant nothing in the hailstorm of Pozieres or Bully Corps or Moss and Quinton where those men fought. Somebody who, who's um, buried in a cemetery, they've got their own place. It's somewhere, it's a focal point for their families to say, well, that's where our George is, or that's where our Alf is. Whereas in the unmarked graves, people just don't know where they are. They're just lost. You know, as unionists, we fight for the dignity of the living. Their hours of work, putting food on the table, uh, been able to get by in the best way they possibly can. So we remember our living members and we fight for them every day, but let's not forget those who gave their lives for us too.